I'm going to start this session and I want to welcome all of you as you are gradually coming in and I hope everybody's able to get in. I see faces arriving, places arriving. Um, I see some of us are in Istanbul and some of us are in Rome and um, although it looks like I'm in Syria, I'm only in snowy and relatively sunny South Bend. For us, it's, uh, it's rather nice out there. Um, so um, thank you so much for being here for this event on behalf of the board and the advisory committee and all the members of the International Catacomb Society. I am very pleased to have the honor of welcoming our speaker today. Um, and I will introduce her briefly um, after I make a couple of quick announcements. I think because um, of the bandwidth and the number of participants, it might be best if most of us are willing to um, turn off our videos and mute ourselves. But I will be um, very happy to have your questions in the chat. And once uh, Nicola is finished with her lecture, I will, I will be the person to kind of curate the questions and pose them to her. So if you have questions, uh, uh, put them in the chat and we will have some time at the end for those. And now my introduction of our speaker, um, my colleague and good friend, Nicola Denzi Lewis. Um, many of you know her, but she is the Margot L. Goldsmith Chair of Women's Studies in Religion in, at the Claremont Graduate School. Um, Nicola is a member of the board of the International Catacomb Society, but she has many other great uh, important titles to her name. Um, she has uh, been on the faculties also of Skidmore College and Bowdoin College, Harvard University, and Brown University. She uh, has two two important books that are very relevant to her presentation for today. One of them she published in 2007 with Beacon Press, The Bone Gatherers, The Lost Worlds of Early Christian Women. But her most recent book, uh, Modern Invention of The Modern Invention of Late Antique Rome, came out fairly recently from Cambridge University Press in 2020. Nicola is a television uh, superstar. <laughs> she's been on CNN's uh, series and she's also advised them to in Finding Jesus. So many of you may know her as a teacher, as a colleague, as a friend, as an author, and we're very glad that she's joined us today for her lecture. So Nicola, I'm going to turn this over to you and I'm going to mute myself. Um, and I, I hope we, the screen sharing works. So we, uh, <laughs> make sure it does. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you, Robin, for that lovely introduction. And it's delightful to be here representing the International Catacomb Society. It's an invaluable organization that has helped me in both small and very substantial ways. And I will be forever thankful to them for the Shohat Fellowship that I received when I really, really needed this that was not forthcoming from my institution at the time. I want to put in a, a quick plug for these Shohat Fellowships that, especially in the last few years, they're specifically uh, look to fund junior scholars or independent scholars who are not affiliated with an institution. So receiving one um, literally provides the livelihood and, and makes the work possible for junior scholars or independent scholars. So I hope today those of you who are not members would um, consider joining. The fee is minimal, uh, both to support scholars, but also because of the benefits uh, of joining, even if you're not a scholar. I think it's always fun to get hooked in with an organization like this that can help support your travel dreams, especially if your travel dreams uh, involve trolling around uh, underground in ancient catacombs. But surely there's gotta be other people around there like that, it's not just me. So with that, I will share my screen. You hear my cats crying to get in. We want in, we want in. <laughs> All right, good. So let's start today. I'm assuming everybody can see that. Thumbs up, Robin, good. Let's start today over in Rome, south of the city, on a lovely late November afternoon on the Via Appia, a major ancient thoroughfare in and out of the city. And along an avenue of cypresses on any nice day, joggers and cyclists thread their way up and down a path. But what's this? In recent years, these signs have sprung up announcing that things like jogging are not allowed, for these are sacred sites, ancient Roman Christian catacombs. And soon you come upon a gated area like this with inside it many people waiting for their underground tours. So what are the catacombs all about? 
As I talk for now, I'm showing you a relatively recent video of a computer 3D scan of a portion of one of these Roman catacombs. This is Domitilla, south of Rome, which demonstrates some of the fantastic work of scholars affiliated with the ICS, particularly Norbert Zimmermann of the Institute for the Study of Ancient Cultures at the Austrian Academy of Sciences in Vienna, in cooperation with Professor Dr. Marina Döring Williams of the Institute für Baugeschichte und Bauforschung at the Technical University of Vienna. So catacombs are vast underground burial sites dating back to the third and fourth century of the Common Era. They're not unique to Rome, but Rome has some of the largest and best preserved complexes in the Mediterranean basin, all of them outside the city walls. Dug from Rome's soft volcanic soil, they extend for miles underground and can be up to five levels deep. They contain the bodies of as many as 1.5 million dead. And for 20 years, perhaps perversely, they have formed the special focus of my academic work. Now, of the 60 or so catacombs around Rome, only five are open to the public. And these are popular tourist sites, receiving upwards of about 400,000 visitors a year. But they're not neutral windows on the past. As tourist sites, they're carefully curated to tell a story about how the past came to be. This is not exclusive to tourist catacombs, of course. It's true of every archaeological site that's open to the public and every museum. And I want to talk today about the things that catacombs can teach us about the past. They're absolutely invaluable resources. But before we can get there, I have to emphasize the point I've just made. As they appear to us today, Rome's catacombs are not neutral data sets where we can trust what we see, hear, or read in order to recover the past. So I'm gonna give you a pro tip. If you go to Rome and you wanna see a catacomb, I'm gonna tell you some of the secret stuff about them that you probably won't hear from any tour guides. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with BuzzFeed. If you're not, BuzzFeed is a popular news site. It actually has some very good journalism but it caters to a different crowd than those who read The Economist or The Washington Post or uh, The Wall Street Journal. And in that it's full of sort of catchy copy and, uh, and lists, it's a lot of fun actually. And because this is supposed to be a sort of brief and accessible lecture, I thought I'd give it the BuzzFeed treatment. So here we go. I'm gonna do 10 things you didn't know about the Roman catacombs and which official guides probably or absolutely will not tell you. And like any good BuzzFeed list, I'm gonna start with number 10 and work my way backwards. Okay, so number 10. Catacombs were uh, not underground cities used to hide Christians during times of persecution. Now, if you go on a catacomb tour today, the guys are very quick to tell you that the idea of Christians hiding out to avoid persecution by Roman authorities never happened to them. Still though, I have heard the story of the fish symbol from many of my students. So here's the fish symbol. Uh, many of you are familiar with it uh, from bumper stickers on cars that drive around uh, in the United States in particular, right? And so the fish symbol is a very ancient Christian symbol which uh, represents Jesus Christ. We know this because the word for fish in Greek, ichthus, is actually a, an anagram, an, a, um, is it an anagram, acrostic, um, for um, a, a particular creedal statement, right? Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior in Greek. And so it was very early on recognized as a symbol for Jesus Christ. This is indisputable. What is in dispute is this kind of mythology around it, that it was used as a secret symbol for Christians to recognize one another at times of persecution. So the story that I've often heard from my students is that somebody in an underground passage would write one of the, the two lines of the fish symbol, and then somebody else would come along and they would write the other line and complete the fish symbol. And that would be a secret way of communicating to one another that they were Christians and that they were in a safe environment. Well, this isn't true. I'm not sure where the story came from, though I don't think it's a very ancient story. So while we do find that symbol in the catacombs occasionally, we can't ascribe to it any, anything to do with persecuted Christians trying to find one another. Now, there are numerous reasons why we know that Christians didn't hide down there. For one, the Christians were never actively persecuted in Rome at a time when there were catacombs. Also, these are very large sites. Uh, and the biggest ones had their entrance very close to imperial guard posts. It would be like 
having a secret party of Democrats um, coming and going from a door across the street from the Trump Tower uh, on Fifth Avenue in New York City, right? It was, would not be a very clever place to have an entrance to a place where you were hiding out. Finally, though, I think a, a convincing reason for me is that we can't um, underestimate really how nasty these sites uh, were in antiquity. They contain mass graves, pit graves, um, and they must really have reeked. Um, the idea that they were used for visitation was really a, a myth. I don't even think that, pe that um, ordinary people went down there to commemorate the dead. And you'll find some people who disagree with me on that, but I'm gonna hold the line on this. So just to give you a little bit of a picture here of this, this is a, a, from the excavations of a mass grave at the catacombs of Pietro Marcellino, south of Rome. It's actually also some of the excavations have been so supported with funds from the International Catacomb Society Shohat funds. Um, and you kind of get the sense of, even though these bodies were um, wrapped up and, and covered with plaster in this case, sometimes lime, but plaster in this particular case, um, and sealed up, these were not um, subject to a lot of visitation. These were sites that were often backfilled and, and they're graves, they're mass graves. You don't kind of go down there and hang out to have your secret meetings. It uh, didn't make a whole lot of practical sense. So number nine, they are almost completely unrelated to the catacombs of Paris. So many people have asked me if the Roman catacombs are the same thing as the Paris catacombs. They're not. To begin with, the Paris catacombs are not ancient. They were developed in the 18th century to cope with the overflow of bodies from the local Parisian churchyards. So these churchyards by this time were so oversaturated with bodies that the soil in them actually no longer broke down corpses. So somebody came up with the idea of depositing the bones and skeletons that were literally poking up out of the ground or being washed down with the rains, you know, into the streets into a system of quarry tunnels um, that ran underneath the city. Then about a century later, a mine inspector by the name of louis etienne eric Tuturi hit upon the idea of arranging the bones by type, right? Uh, literally developing the site for thanotourism. So tickets for things like um, chamber music ensembles down there were really hot commodities in the 19th century. Still today, um, I once had a student at Brown, uh, whose parents rented out a section of the Paris catacombs for her 18th birthday party, right? Uh, and I have a nice color, colored print here uh, of, you know, fun in the catacombs, right? And the guy hiding there with a little kind of spell on a stick and jumping out as they're doing these tours. Um, so it was really used for, uh, for um, almost a kind of titillation, really sort of typical thanatourism stuff, um, whether it was listening to um, music down there for something um, formal like this chamber ensemble or just kind of going down to get um, spooked or freaked out. Now, this is not what the Roman catacombs um, were ever used for. The Roman catacombs, by contrast, date uh, back to early third century. Their first use for tourism was in the 19th century and was engineered by this man up there in the top left, Giovanni Battista de Rossi, uh, not for thanatourism exactly, but for um, as pilgrimage sites to go and visit the graves of the martyrs. And here I've got this wonderful chroma tint uh, of de Rossi there, uh, dressed in black in the center. And he's taking his papal patron, who's Pius IX, down into the catacombs of Calixtus that he had, um, de Rossi had discovered. Um, to show him some inscriptions uh, of third century popes that he found out there. It was a very moving moment for Pius IX as he went and he saw um, his um, ancestors up in the sort of papal succession buried down in this catacomb. And uh, this was a great moment for de Rossi where his sort of dream of an archaeologist, his Catholic ar archaeologist came true that he was able to find um, these early popes who were buried there. It's a great story. You can read all about it in my latest book, just to give myself a little plug there. So the only connection between these sites, remember I said like almost completely unrelated, is that Napoleon apparently promoted the Paris catacombs as a tourist draw to rival Rome's. So there is that sort of little connection there as, as uh, Napoleon kind of wants to have the Paris catacombs be as important as the Rome catacombs. They do very different things. 
All right. Catacombs represent an innovation in burial culture, not driven by religion, but by necessity. So people often associate the catacombs with Christians and Christianity, but this is actually a false association. The catacombs didn't spring up because Christians wanted their own burial spaces. In fact, burial according to religious affiliation was unknown at Rome. Rather, by the third century, most of the above ground territory outside the city walls had already been used for burial and was very full, much like the situation we see much later in Paris. So rather than digging even farther out from the city, they chose to go down. Right? The first catacombs, in fact, were reused industrial spaces, so quarries uh, and cisterns, and people started using these as cheap and convenient spots to deposit bodies. They weren't used anymore, they were already dug and they were there. Because Rome's volcanic soil is light and very strong, it's perfect for subterranean tunneling, and these industrial spaces could be extended relatively easily as needed, right? Um, moving under property lines uh, outwards for miles and also downwards. So this is uh, a plan of the catacombs of San Callisto, so the largest complex in Rome. You can see actually the heart of it is kind of over here, and then there's this network of the crisscrossing tunnels. Um, but you can see how it just sort of grew out very organically um, from these central cores. In this case, these weren't um, quarries that were used. This was probably um, an earlier private barrel of sort of mausoleum or a couple of, of mausolea, and it began to be um, spread outwards as Christians took over this space. And it works very nicely, right, because you can get underneath property lines, you can get underneath roads and so on, and just kind of keep expanding in ways that is very helpful. And it's all dug as needed, um, according to um, what people um, might commission for them. So catacombs, therefore, met specific needs, right, and avoided the sort of problems of land ownership, and they had no nothing whatsoever to do with religion. Number seven, another interesting fact, there are almost no infants buried in the catacombs. Okay, I think this is weird and nobody ever really talks about it. So we assume that the catacombs were cemeteries for everyone, but in fact, only about 1.3% of the graves uh, are to children under the age of a year. So this is strange because infant mortality could be as high as 40% at the time. In third century Rome, just to give you some statistics and so far as we can figure them out, about one third of live born infants were dead by the age of one and one half by the age of five. So where are the babies? It remains a mystery, but apparently not in the catacombs. Now, some recent excavations in France of Roman houses discovered numerous neonate and infant skeletons buried under the floor, um, in the walls, uh, in the roofs. So uh, apparently depositing your deceased babies in the house with you seems to have been a thing that Romans practiced. More disturbingly, maybe, uh, excavations of sites in Buckinghamshire in the UK and in Ashkelon in Israel uh, revealed an abundance of neonate skeletons in the drains of Roman bath complexes. So this is a little earlier, this is like maybe first, second century, but still one interesting thing is that as the empire Christianized, there was not a fundamental shift in the way that parents dealt with their deceased children. So. Um, this is, again, a little bit of a mystery, and not to say that there aren't uh, babies buried in the catacombs. There are, and uh, as the children get older, there's a little more of them, um, but still, statistically speaking, there should be many, many more than there appear to be. All right. Number six. Despite the name Christian catacombs, not just Christians were buried there. And this was a hugely important insight, it was beautifully argued in a, a famous spectacular article argued by Professor John Bodell, who's actually on the board of the International Catacomb Society. He's supposed to be here with us today. I don't know whether John is there, but a shout out, hi John. Um, absolutely fantastic work that has um, shaken up a very deep-seated notion that the Christian catacombs are really just for Christians. I've been reassured by Christian by catacomb guys that only Christians were buried there. Now, if you go on a catacomb tour today, um, you will hear this uh, often, um, that it's, again, exclusively Christian burial spaces. 
before you go down underground in many of the major catacomb sites, you actually get a little lecture on Christian art and symbolism beforehand. And they ask you to look out for these Christian symbols um, on grave closures as you go down into the complex. So in other words, the guides present Christian symbols on graves as kind of labels like, hello, I am a Christian, right? But in fact, it's really impossible to identify most graves by their religious affiliation. Only about 10% of catacomb graves um, have anything, any sort of marking on them at all. And some of it is really ambiguous, very hard to read as primarily Christian because it doesn't seem to be the case that the most important thing for people to record about themselves on their grave markings is their religious affiliation. Name is more important, family association is more important, um, but not all of them thought to broadcast a religious identity. And even if it was on there, we have to be careful about how we read ambiguous evidence. So I'm going to give you an example, a very famous one. This is not from the catacombs, but this is said to be probably our earliest Christian um, grave inscription from the city of Rome. This is the, the stone of a woman named Lysini Amias. It is very Greek or Roman, Greek or Roman in its style, um, the shape of it with the acritaria, the little kind of points, the classic Greek form of it. Uh, it says to uh, well-deserving Lysinia, uh, who lived, and we don't have the biometrics um, broken off on the bottom of that, but the, the form of it is pretty standard. Uh, and the thing that catches your eye, of course, is uh, the fish uh, symbol and the anchor, which is another early Christian symbol. So this is, okay, this looks like a Christian stone. It also has this inscription up at the top, um, ichthos zonton, so the fish of the living. So this is a, a Greek. Um, it seems to very clearly point to the fish uh, being Jesus Christ, associated with Jesus Christ. None of this is ambiguous um, or beyond question that these are Christian symbols. The thing that trips us up is what's happening at the very top of the stone where you have the letters DM. Now DM stands for Dis Manibus, that is, it's a dedication to the spirits of the dead, uh, to the manis, uh, and it's a pretty clear-cut way that we as scholars mark a stone as being not Christian or not Jewish, right? Um, the term pagan is kind of a derogative one, we use it as a short form, so we can call it a pagan description if you want. Um, so this stone has both, right? It's got sort of this, this pagan superscription at the top, and then it's got this Christian symbolism in the middle of it. What does that mean? Does that mean that Lysinia Amias was absolutely Christian? Uh, does it mean that uh, she was a convert? Does it mean that somebody in her family was Christian and somebody was pagan? We don't know. We can't access, unfortunately, that material. But what we can't do is just say this is unambiguously Christian because Surely at the time, the situation was a little bit more complicated. I'll give you some other examples. So this uh, uh, is a catacomb that was discovered in 1955. This catacombs um, used to be called the Catacombs of Via Latina. Uh, it's now called the Catacombs of uh, Via Dino Campani. And it's fantastic. It's a fairly small catacomb, it's about 400 graves in there. And it contains iconography, very richly painted, from the Christian, Jewish, um, and again, pagan, to use that short form, traditions. So it seems to be a kind of mixed constituency. I'll show you a couple of pictures from it. It's gorgeous paintings in here. Here is uh, Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. I think it's discussion possible of John, although this little, the little tondo, the little figure up on the top is very, looks like a, like a season, this, again, a very um, non-Christian depiction. Here's a lovely one. Um, here's Noah standing in his ark. I always loved these little box arcs at the time, which are evocative of, of baptismal font, something that Robin, of course, knows all about far more than I do. This is another grave. This is the Roman goddess Tellus, goddess associated with the earth, although when it was first discovered, People thought that this was Cleopatra, maybe. Yeah, it's hard to see in this picture, but she actually has a snake or an asp wrapped around her arm as she's reclining. Um, but it's absolutely not a Christian image. 
And here is um, the penultimate and ultimate chambers in this complex, something I've written a lot on, these, these two rooms. And fantastic iconography in here. There's actually a cycle from the play Alcestis. Uh, and if you can see on there, there's not very many people buried and there's only actually two graves in the first room and one in the back. But on one side, and as you can see, um, Hercules. And here is the goddess Demeter or uh, a, um, I say somebody who is um, venerating the goddess Demeter, she's got wheat sheaths in her hands. And over here in the back one, here's Daniel in the lion's den, right? And here's a little kind of angel, and there's also angels and peacocks here, which is kind of neutral religious symbolism. So cases like this are really very interesting. This is a fourth century grave, Constantinian, post-Constantinian era. Uh, Sub elite didn't belong to the wealthiest people, but people with a you know fair bit of money, and it seems to be that their religious affiliation was mixed, and what exactly that relationship was within the family we don't know. The work that I've done on this particular one, I've actually argued that the entire thing was commissioned by a woman um, who was not herself Christian. She buries in the very last room, the single grave here, um, her daughter who was Christian. It's a reconstruction historically. I may be wrong. I think I'm right personally, of course. Uh, but it says sort of some interesting things about what, again, what religious affiliation looked like in the fourth century and the way in which there was more of a slow transition from, um, uh, well, to Christianity at this time than sometimes we take for granted. And there was much more mixing uh, and there was much more sharing of um, grave spaces between people of different religious affiliations. So as for Jewish burials, because we want to talk about them, um, it's a kind of an interesting fact too that there were also Jewish burials in the Christian catacombs. Though again, it was um, something which catacomb guides still now um, deny. If, uh, if there were Jewish symbols in a particular area of the Christian catacombs, they generally thought, oh, those, that was separate. Um, rather than integrated. There's been historically a lot of difficulty uh, with the Catholic Church in the early modern period uh, acknowledging Jewish burials in there. This is a piece of gold glass from um, a catacomb, and you can see it's got Jewish imagery on it. So it's got Menorot on either side, uh, the Aron HaKodesh, it's got the, the Torah Ark in the center with Torah scrolls in the middle of it. It's got a shofar over on, on one side. So a lot of Jewish symbolism. And this was discovered um, in a Christian catacomb. And in fact, all the Jewish gold glass that we have, for which we have a provenance, where we know where it came from, came from Christian catacombs. Not a single piece of Jewish gold glass has been connected to Jewish catacombs, very interestingly, although we do have some gold glass that have come from, um, from Jewish catacomb sites. So. Um, that's kind of interesting point brings us to number five. Jewish catacombs are an early modern Roman myth. This is very controversial. This comes out of the work that I've done. So I'm taking responsibility for this because um, uh, it does freak some people out in this. Um, as many as six ancient Jewish catacombs have been identified all around the city's periphery. Of these, only two remain today. And of those, only one is accessible. That's the catacombs of Vigna Randonini. I think I've got a picture where you see it down here at the bottom. Um, I'll put in another plug for, uh, for the ICS. Can you go and see the catacombs of Vigna Randonini? Why, yes, you can, if you contact the International Catacomb Society uh, and we can help connect you to the guides who can take you down to see this site, which is otherwise closed to the public. And it's a great service, again, that, that the International Catacomb Society can, uh, can help you with. And as you can see from the map there, it is directly across the street from the Vatican-administered uh, Catacombs of San Sebastiano. So this catacomb has an amazing find story, uh, in fact, for which I'm indebted to Dr. Jessica Della Russo from the International Catacomb Society, who just successfully defended her dissertation yay, on ancient Jewish tomb types. 
So to make a very long um, story short, the person on whose land this catacombs were discovered in the 19th century tried to sell it to the Catholic church <clears throat> like his lucky neighbor across the street under whose land lies the catacombs uh, of San Sebastiano and nearby the, the San Calixtus catacombs. But the church wasn't interested in buying it because when they went and looked at these catacombs, the Vignorandanini ones, they discovered that some menorot, menorahs had been painted on the walls. So it was a Jewish site, therefore the Vatican was not interested um, in purchasing the land and supporting it. So in order to make some money, the site was actually cleaned up um, and it was turned into sort of a showcase and it, it became interestingly a sort of counter site for pilgrims and for Thanatorists um, who commented in the 19th century on how miserable and drab these Jewish catacombs were compared to the splendid Christian ones across the street. We have this literature where we can read these letters mostly from um, English tourists going and visiting. So here I'll show you just a little bit of it. There's another one of these 3D um, rendered images and you can see this is the last cubiculum, the last chamber in the complex. Um, and incidentally, uh, it contains rather famously no recognizable Jewish imagery. So what this means again um, has been very controversial for scholars. Um, does it mean that the Jewish people who are using this site used pagan imagery and not Jewish imagery? Um, if so, what does that say about religious affiliation? Does it mean that the people who are buried in this particular uh, chamber were not Jewish at all? That's why they didn't put the Jewish symbolism in their chamber, even though there are any other ones in this complex. It, it's very hard, again, for us to know categorically why we have um, non-Jewish imagery in a Jewish catacomb where there's also lots of Jewish imagery. We just don't know. Next one, number four. New catacombs are often discovered um, still today in Rome. I think this is kind of nifty. So essentially the lands uh, outside the third century walls of Rome are giant cemeteries. So it's no real surprise that new ones are discovered almost every year. Um, a white Volkswagen discovered this one. Um, at least six cars discovered this one. A cat even discovered this one. Um, kind of cool. So this is not surprising unless you're actually in the car or in the bus or whatever at the time when this is discovered. But let me tell you why this is significant. All five of the major catacomb tourist sites are operated as Christian shrines by the Vatican. And while the Vatican's Pontifical Commission for Sacred Archaeology oversees all excavation of new catacombs, they're much less beholden today to the early modern Catholic sentiments and ideologies that drove Vatican archaeologists in the 16th century and even into the 19th century. So for this reason, the sites are pristine. Right? And they lack some of the ideologically driven alterations that were made in the 16th century. And consequently, scientists have been able to do things like DNA analysis or isotopic analyses of human remains, yielding really important information for us about the past. Number three, you can explore two catacombs from your couch or your desk. Guess what? You don't have to go to Rome or let me revise and, and put that differently because going to Rome should never be undesirable. Um, if you are not able to go to Rome, um, a few years ago, the Pontifical Commission collaborated with Google Earth to put two sites uh, up on Google Maps. So the first one is the catacombs of Priscilla, Priscilla, um, up towards the northeast uh, of the city. And if you type catacombs of Priscilla into Google Maps, you will actually be able to go down, thanks to modern technology, into the catacomb sites and um, tour your way around through the galleries. And this is just fantastic to be able to, um, to have that kind of access from afar. The other one that works like this is uh, the Ipogeo, the catacombs of Via Dino Campani. Campani, this is the one that I already showed you the pictures from, the one with the Samaritan woman um, and Tellus. Um, these are close to the public, and like the catacombs of Priscilla are open, you can go and see them. These ones you can't go and see. They are very 
carefully guarded uh, in their entrance by the by the Vatican because they have uh, so many paintings that are extremely fragile. Uh, even a hot breath directly on them could do damage. And so it's uh, virtually impossible to go down there. I've tried begging and like, I would just, you know, use a long straw um, to breathe up to the, to the surface, but it's, it's really an extraordinary and lucky thing if you can get access to this. When I wrote my first book, it came out in 2007, I have a couple of chapters uh, that talk about the imagery in this catacomb and I wasn't able to get in at the time. And it was, it took me a very long time to uh, to take all the pictures that were there and to kind of map them out so that I could get some sense of if you were standing in a room, what image you would see on your left and what image you would see on your right, what you would see behind you. Um, all I had was a whole series of pictures. Uh, and so I would have given anything for this kind of access that now you can get just from your desktop at home where you could go down there and spin around in a room and you can see what that relationship is because there's a clear relationship um, between the images. Even in this one that, I'm, that I've showed you here, the main picture, you can see there's um, little figures who are actually standing in front of doors. So they, they're a great visual plays in this catacomb of like opening doors and closing doors and people coming and going um, in painting as you're moving through it. So there was a real intentionality paid to um, the relationship between the images and the images to the room. So this is a fantastic resource if you're ever bored on a rainy day, uh, don't need to have a good academic question or reason rationale for doing it, you can go down um, on your laptop and move around and see these two very different sites. Number two. So although they were once believed to contain the bones of scores of martyrs, most people buried in the catacombs weren't martyrs, but were just ordinary Romans. So if you read my most recent book, I start in a little town called Monselice, which is fairly close to, to Padova, and a chapel there that contains the bodies of 24 martyrs taken from the Roman catacombs, um, including St. Valentine, he just had his holiday, um, St. Valentine's there in Montselice specializes in curing fevers and epilepsy. The Montselice uh, Chapel, it's an oratory uh, dedicated to San Giorgio, is, is a pretty, pretty amazing place. It's, <laughs> I'll tell you this sort of brief story about it. It's, it's a little bit about it in my book. When I, I first went there a long time ago, when I was in graduate school and uh, studying Italian there, and I met some architecture students and they were actually housed in the villa that is attached to this chapel. And they were terrified of this chapel because they said it, it contained the bodies of um, really creepy saints and they wouldn't go anywhere near it. So one day I decided I would go and I would check out this chapel and see what was in it. So I went in and my eyes sort of adjusted and at the back, wall of this chapel, there are glass fronted coffins, 24 of them, and there are six rows of four, and each one of these contains a body um, of a catacomb saint taken from, um, from the Roman catacombs, and they're labeled as such. And these skeletons now are dressed up in elaborate garments, um, their faces are all still showing, although they seem to, I read once that they actually had a paste or plaster, which was covered over some of the skeletons to make features for them so that they had noses and they didn't look like skulls, um, but they didn't look really like people either. And, uh, you know, since they had been in there, mice had come along and kind of nibbled little clothes, the holes in their clothes and the little toe bones are sticking out of their, um, their little booties. And um, all, all in all, when you go in it, by candlelight, it's a pretty creepy sight, right? These little um, saints there. And I was really very curious about it and didn't know why they were there. So I subsequently then went and did a, a whole lot of research, which eventually resulted in the book that came out last year where I talk about them. So I will show you something of them. This is only just um, a little detail. 
this is the body of uh, somebody who's identified as the virgin by the name of Faustina, who died at the age of 21, was martyred. And you can see here, she's holding a um, chalice in her hand, as a vas sanguinis, which means vessel of blood. And behind her, as her sort of certificate of authenticity, it's actually her epitaph um, taken from the tombstones and uh, taken from the, the catacombs and set up in these glass fronted coffins. So really kind of interesting. So um, they're actually buried, not just with their tombstones, but with um, these little vases, these little glass vessels, that were literally hacked out of the, the stone closures of the catacombs, the, the mortar, and are placed in the graves with them. You can't see it in this particular picture, but take my word for it that it's in there. It's very dark. So why are these little vases from the catacombs stuck in there? Well, in the 16th century, it was believed um, when they looked at these vases that they contained a red sediment. And this red sediment, they thought, was blood. Hence the vas sanguinis there, like the vessel of blood. And if you look at the reproduction of her tombstone, you'll see there um, that it actually has up at the top little corner, there's that little, little vase that's on there too, that means that when Faustina's grave was excavated, it had one of these little vessels next to it. So all the skeletons in the Roman, the Roman catacombs that were excavated, let's say plundered, in the 16th century that had these little vases next to them were thought to be martyrs, right? And that is why Faustina makes her way up here to Moselice, where she's buried, because she supposedly is a Christian martyr. Now, in the 19th century, and we have Giovanni Battista di Rosti to thank for this, I've already mentioned him, the the sediment in these vessels was um, analyzed and it was discovered that it wasn't blood at all. It was the remains of aromatics. So in other words, it wasn't blood at all. It was perfume that this was not a marker of martyrdom, but in fact, these were ancient air fresheners. Uh, and they're there because again, of the smell of these tubes. So kind of an interesting little kind of switch here. You notice that's going on again in early modern Rome uh, where they're seeing these graves. They think that these graves are the ones of martyrs because they're buried with the little um, vessels of blood, but in actual fact, they are just the tombs of ordinary people. But that doesn't come out till 19th century. Which brings me to number one. So in the 16th century, catacombs um, first became the sacred shrines or thought of as being sacred shrines. And the Catholic Church, in fact, went so far as to hire grave robbers to empty the catacombs of skeletons and bones, which were then sold across Europe and beyond, becoming catacomb saints. So in the major catacombs of the city, if you go down and visit them today, you won't see many bones these days. And I've actually heard people be very disappointed about this. And just like one big American guy was down there going, where are the bones? I thought there were bones. <laughs> Um, not a lot of bones in there. A lot of the graves, especially the ones that are kind of at eye level or around your hands, um, are, um, are completely empty. I've heard catacomb guides uh, tell people and tell me that the tombs were opened and ransacked by barbarians in the sack of the city in 410 and other subsequent uh, sacks. It's not true. It was not the case. Alaric and his Goths were actually Christians. They didn't have a whole lot of reason to ransack the tombs of ordinary people. They had much better and easier spoils that they could find elsewhere, not in poor people's um, graves in there. They did leave behind some graffiti, but it was actually quite pious graffiti that we find um, written in Gothic a little bit later. So if it wasn't the barbarians who broke into these tombs, the answer is in the 16th century, again, the Catholic Church developed this core of grave robbers who were called the Corpus Santai. And their job was to remove the catacomb bones so that they could be sold to the highest bidder, like the people who had the villa at um, Moselice. And they also would sow Catholicism and Catholic piety outside Rome. So this is why, in surprising places, long dead ancient Romans 
came to be what we call catacomb saints. And we find them reclining in splendor in places like Switzerland or Bavaria, arriving there in the Counter Reformation, where uh, usually nuns working in the convents would take these Roman skeletons um, and adorn them absolutely beautifully so that they could reside behind the altar. So you see some of them here. I've got another beautiful one too. So this kind of explains how it is right, that these skeletons from Rome so far away end up um, being revered in this way and are set up in these shrines all the way um, through parts of Northern Europe. So that is 10 interesting facts about the catacombs. I hope you can get to Rome. And when you do, you can visit these amazing sites. They still have so much to teach us. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Nicola. Uh, it was really lots of interesting facts and lots of interesting things you had to say, share with us. Um, I am uh, going now to look at the chat box and I can see whether there are questions arriving. Um, I'm looking, I don't necessarily see any at this moment, but I will give you all a minute to put them in if you have any. You're getting some praise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Uh, and I think it's probably um, wonderful to, to point out Michaela Pavancello's comment about doing the tours of, of Vigna Randonini, because again, this is a fantastic resource uh, for people. So just kind of highlight that. Uh, I think Lillian Doherty has a question for you, Nicola. Is there evidence of syncretism in the use of, and I don't know what the answer rest of that sentence would be, but maybe... Uh, Sorry, I, I didn't finish typing it. Um, <laughs> I was intrigued to see that in the catacomb with the um, the image of, of uh, Heracles with Alcestis and mm -hmm. Demeter, that there was also the Christian uh, symbolism. I was wondering, is there any chance that there's a syncretism there? Because Alcestis comes back from the dead and mm -hmm. Demeter's daughter comes back from the dead. Mm -hmm. So is there a chance that the mother and daughter maybe harmonize their faith in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And, and I write about this in, um, in the Bone Gatherers, if you're interested in a really kind of full exposition about it. But it's a, it's a great question. I think when this catacomb was first discovered in 1955, and they looked at these remarkable images, there was um, the, the first sort of the first group of interpreters said, oh, Hercules is shown here as a kind of a type of Christ. And uh, because you have this sort of the story of Al Alcestis, right? Um, coming back from the dead, um, myths around mourning, all this other kind of stuff. Um, it was a Greek myth that was used by Christians to speak allegorically, right? Uh, about the same sorts of concerns. And I, and I think that's certainly one valid way of in interpreting what's going on in there. My analysis was, was really that um, the if it was really a Roman woman, as I think it was, who commissioned the art in this, and again, the, the reasons I think it was a Roman woman are, it's, it takes a long time to explain, but you can read about it. Um, and she herself wasn't Christian. She was drawing on um, especially the myth of Demeter and, and uh, Persephone, right, to express the loss of a mother for a daughter. And that when it came to Christian iconography, there was only so far you could go with drawing on biblical imagery on that. There wasn't really anything there that expressed a mother's loss for a child as effectively as this other story did. And I should say like in these two chambers, um, they don't mix iconography so much. So there's, a, there's, there's um, Heracles and Alcestis in the one chamber and then in the other chamber, um, you have just Christian imagery, um, but, but there's clearly a kind of an overlap with the Demeter and Persephone story. Because actually, it's not true. There is Demeter and Persephone on the ceiling of the Christian one. So I think a lot is going on here. And, and again, we have to be kind of creative about um, uh, the way that maybe they were reading this. And I think syncretism is, is definitely um, one answer. And the way that I went with it was, again, what would you use in the fourth century to express grief 
right? What stories, what religious symbols can you draw on? And, and whether they were Christian or not might not have been a primary concern. What you really want to concern, what you really want to convey is, um, is, is sorrow. Thanks so much. Uh, Nicola, I want to jump in quickly and let uh, read, read Lynn's uh, 06 yeah. question for you. I'm wondering the same thing. So could you comment on the lack of evidence for meals in the catacombs, though there yeah. are frescoes of such meals and good evidence from Malta? Yeah, I, I think it has to do honestly with, um, with geography in that. Like, um, uh, my mother's Maltese, and so I've spent a lot of time in Malta, and I was just there last summer, actually, and and I went into um, a number of the catacombs, including one school which are uh, close to the public. But the difference between the Roman catacombs and the, the Maltese ones is the Maltese ones aren't very deep. Um, they, uh, they have very large open areas that open into um, fresh air. They are carved out of limestone rather than tufa. And as such, they are drier and more open and um, more pleasant probably in order to have a meal. So when I, there's no question that meals in Rome were done in triclinia that were up on the level of the surface. But when you get down in like four layers deep, even though some of the uh, catacombs, most of the catacombs have wells um, in them, you can't have fires, you can't prepare meals and there's just, it's not a very good place to sit and eat. There's not, um, there are open spaces, um, but they don't open into the air the way that the, the Maltese ones do. So I think it was just really what you could do in, in the Maltese ones was very different than what you could do in the, the Roman ones, practically speaking. That would be my answer. Um, from Marko Jovanovic, um, do we have any traces of Mithraism in the catacombs? Do you know? Um, Mithraism, it's a complicated question. Um, you do have a couple, I'm thinking of the, um, uh, I'm blanking on the name right now, uh, Vibia, maybe the catacombs of Vibia, which are, were originally attached to the Christian catacombs and have been uh, seen as a separate um, part of the Catacombs of Praetext Tatus um, that has a, a priest of Sabasius in there uh, and some other kind of pagan priest things, but nothing that explicitly corresponds to Mithraism. The reason that's a little bit of a, a tricky question is that, again, most of the, uh, the major catacomb sites were excavated, again, by the Catholic Church. And if something didn't look really Catholic, it was either removed um, or it was sectioned off, like the section that I just talked about at Pretextatus, which is seen as the separate catacombs of Bibia, even though they're actually contiguous. Um, so I don't think we can say absolutely for sure that there was no Mithraic um, statuary or inscriptions from the catacomb once there. Certainly are not now, and they were not recorded to have been such. Um, but it's Possible. I'm thinking of there's a couple of beautiful Mithraic stones, um, say that are in the Vatican, and I don't know what the provenance is on those. I don't know where they come come from. But so the short answer is no, um, and the long answer is also probably no. Um, but never say never. I see John Bodell's hand up. Do you want to jump in here, John? Jump in, John. <laughs> Yes, uh, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Robin. And, and thank you, Nicola, for the wonderful talk. I always learn a ton. And, and thanks for the shout out. Um, my question uh, takes you really follows on the comment you were just making about how Mithraic evidence, if ever there, might have been quietly a <laughs> sideline. Yes. And I wondered, that was a wonderful picture that you showed from your from your new book, I think, also of De Rossi and Pope Leo down in the catacombs. And mm -hmm. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about that incident or the nexus, that important nexus and its influence on how the catacombs were studied. You, you comment on this, but that uh, particularly, it was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, so De Rossi as a very faithful Christian who's, who's absolutely um, fascinated by the catacombs and really wants to be the new Antonio Bosio. He wants to go down and he wants to discover new catacombs and so on. Um, is becomes obsessed with um, 
figuring out where these where these catacombs were in the city, right? They had not all been discovered. I can't remember offhand what's the first date of the catacomb rediscovery. It's like 1592, something like that. I should know this, but it's not quite there. And De Rossi, um, he spent some time in the Vatican uh, as a lector. He reads a lot of texts. He's in the libraries. He works with the ancient texts, things like the Liber Pontificalis that um, talk about the, the burial places of the popes, for instance, and he decides he's going to figure out where these are. He takes the pilgrim guides that also describe kind of landmarks in Rome and say, if I visited the, you know, the saint shrine there, and he does this sort of triangulation, goes out in these vineyards at the time, and um, starts excavating, and he finds very early a big stone that um, has the name of Cornelius on it, and he thinks, oh, what, Cornelius, this is amazing, this is this mid-third century um, pope, who was involved in these at the, De the time of the Decian persecutions. And um, this is extraordinary. I have a, a papal inscription. So I'm going to take that papal inscription and I'm going to go to the Pope and say, hey, look, I think I've discovered where all the popes were buried, right? Using all these ancient texts and so on and with the, um, with the inscription. So he goes to the Pope and the Pope is like, ah, no, um, and sends him off. He's not interested in buying up these lands. And um, De Rossi, undeterred, keeps excavating. And he discovers this very large catacomb complex that he uh, surmises is the first in the original of the uh, Christian catacombs he ascribes to um, the, the deacon and later uh, Pope Calixtus, still called that today. And while he's looking around down there, he also finds a number, a, a number of other inscriptions that bear the names of third century popes. Uh, and he thinks this is it, this is, um, you know, this is it, absolutely und undisputably proof that these are these catacombs and this is where the popes were buried. So he actually finds one chamber and it's empty when he finds it. And he gathers up all these papal inscriptions and sets them back in this chamber, um, sets them up, cleans it up, and says, this is the crypt where originally all these popes were buried. And he goes and he finds the Pope again, and he brings him down into the crypt, what's now called the Crypt of the Popes in the Catacombs of Calixtus. And he says, look, I did it, right? I was dismissed by you uh, when I came and talked to you and you were like dreams of an archeologist, right? And here it is, the dreams of the archeologist. I found the place where you're, um, ancestors, your papal ancestors, uh, spiritual ancestors were buried. And so the Pope is just blown away by this. And he does, in fact, um, patronize him. He does buy those lands. He does um, support him uh, as an archaeologist, funds his um, uh, excavations and the publications of his books. All So it's just this kind of fantastic moment. And uh, I think what I wrote about in my book was a little bit controversial in that I say, well, this crypt of the Pope was really the construction of De Rossi, and he does it um, not, not dissembling, um, not dishonestly, because I think he absolutely believed he had found um, the crypt where these popes were buried. But he also makes it clear, if you read um, carefully his excavation reports, that there, were, there wasn't anything in there until he moved all these stones in, into the place and created the shrine. And it's still known as the, the Little Vatican, uh, if you go down there today and they say this is, you know, this is the, kind of the place where it all heart, happens. So it's sort of the heart of the Christian catacom. It's a good story. And thanks, John, for giving me the opportunity to tell it. <laughs> we have two questions left and I want to make them very quick. Um, and then Anavis has a comment that she'd like to make. So I want to, um, David Kreish is asking for any uh, studies on the phenomena of neonatal burial. Do you have yeah. any suggestions? Um, I do. I'm trying to think. I mean, most of those archaeological studies, the ones that I was mentioned, is at, at, written up by Veronique Dassin, D-A-S-E-N. Uh, and she is, uh, yeah, she's a French archaeologist who worked specifically on the neonatal stuff. She didn't do the Ashkelon ones uh, or Buckinghamshire. She wrote a lot about neonates um, buried in the walls uh, of villas. And, and she's probably the best source out there. I mean, she could give all the other bibliography, most of which is in uh, a lot of it is in French. I'm also thinking Janet Huskinson has a recent work on children, um, but I, I had to come up with the name of it. 
for the work. Um, and very quickly, um, we have uh, one more question from Nicola Hayward um, about the well in the Via Latina Catacomb. Do you know uh, what it was used for? <laughs> um, yeah, there is a well. There's um, There are wells in all of them. And uh, what they were used for is, you know, again, I, some time ago, I, I think when I was researching bone gatherers, when I wrote about it, um, some of the wells were clearly used um, baptismally. There's one in Priscilla that does the same. I can tell if it's got little crosses all, all over it. It's it's much larger than the entrance to it. The well in Latina is actually quite little. And, and I don't think it was used uh, as a baptismal font. I don't think it was used for rites of, like that. Um, I think it was probably just a kind of necessary thing when you're honestly, when you're building and excavating that a, a water source um, is useful when you're down there. So I think it was, it was just sort of a, a pragmatic necessity when you're digging for layers underground and you need access to light. Uh, and you also probably need access for water for mixing up the mortar, uh, for instance, that you use for tomb closures. So, I don't think it was used for preparing food. Um, I don't think it was liturgically used, although again, in a couple of the, the catacombs, you clearly have um, wells that were used for baptism, um, but maybe a little bit later, uh, maybe kind of mm, fifth, sixth century. Anna V. Sonnenhock, our, our uh, president emeritus of longstanding and great honor, would you like to make a comment? <laughs> Hi, well, thank you, <laughs> Nicola, wonderful to uh, to hear this. Uh, uh, I just want to, to make a little plug for um, our website and because I did a lot of photography there. Uh, mm -hmm. Among others, um, a, a rather small museum in the Vatican. Vatican has many parts and most people when they come out of the whole tour of the Sixteen, uh, the Sixteen Chapel, they are sort of tired and just walked through it, but this was called the Museo Cristiano, a, um, I think one of the, the first museums there with materials from the catacombs. And uh, since you, uh, you just said that a lot of the, this stuff was dis, disregarded, uh, apparently uh, the most sort of precious things were still precious enough to uh, to keep it and so I recommend if you are in Rome just to to have a look at that because it's also uh, very nicely labeled I don't know how uh, reliable the labels are but uh, and also actually you don't have to go to Rome because I photographed everything every detail and it's uh, on in our on our website but you have to become a member of course first to see it um, and uh, but uh, it's it's very interesting, uh, and I think you could give a whole new lecture on the 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 kind of materials that they found there, because some are Christian, but uh, certainly mm -hmm. or identifiable as uh, as Christian. But there are lots of other bits and pieces that. Uh, uh, are, are interesting and of course they could have been found uh, on top of the catacombs and have been fallen uh, or, or we don't know exactly so you cannot make any any conclusions but at any rate it's interesting to to look at these materials mm -hmm. yeah there's some fantastic and surprising things in, in that collection and uh, and it's such a weird site isn't it and like everybody's you know thundering through having just come from the Sistine Chapel and nobody's looking what's in the cases and I'm there right and, you know I like uh, taking pictures of every single thing in there and there there are like little little bone chip sphinxes and little mm -hmm. glass um ornaments and bells well, they, of course the, yeah. the the Vatican has the most important glass uh, gold class collection there is yep. and it the has been 
well published also but uh, no and if, even if you want to only to see that part you cannot even enter there because the guard will uh, hold you you have to take the whole tour first That's right exactly <laughs> I, I would say i'm not going to look at the sistine chapel this time i'm just going to go that stuff and i always right, end up I have, looking at the sistine chapel because it's so you know it just captures you when you're there and right but, I, I actually I, have done that and also with a little extra help so it is possible <laughs> it's hard to get out of the let the guards get you out of that line however um, I, we're, we're sort of at the end of our time before we go and people disappear i want to just quickly uh, announce that we have two more uh, events coming up one on april 3rd and one on may 1st and each of these events will be a panel of some of our recent show head fellows and i think i happen to notice that lily Wong. Uh, popped in here with a comment and I wanted to shout, give her a shout out because she'll be one of the presenters on May 1st. So um, be on, you know, be alert. Uh, we'll be putting up uh, advertisements for these two events, April 3rd and Sunday at 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern U.S. time and May 1st, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern U.S. time, both of them panels of recent show head fellows. And then coming up in June, and I think he's still present with us, uh, Professor Norbert Zimmerman will be giving a keynote address. Um, I believe we have settled on June 26th, but um, more on that to come um, and his title. And we're very excited about all of these events. And we thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope you come back. And we hope you join the society. And then you can get into those wonderful uh, photographs that Anna has been describing <laughs> and many other things besides. <laughs> so thank you for, um, for, for joining us today. And I hope I see you again. And thanks again, Nicola, for that wonderful presentation. We were so grateful to you. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank bye you bye. Again. Bye Thanks. bye from Rome. Bye. <laughs> bye. bye. <laughs> Maybe see you there too.